Jesus said to go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to every person. We invite you to join us for the next 30 minutes as God's Word is presented, recorded live from the pulpit at Hillel Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. Today's message is brought to you by Steve Kirby, Hildale's pulpit minister. Good morning. Today's reading will come from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. You may be seated. had this up last week, and I said it was this week. I was a week ahead, but it's correct to say this week. <laughs> Connect Conference begins on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at the Creve Hall Church of Christ in Nashville. The uh, bus is going on Friday, leaves at 7 a.m. All the senior worship order, the evening keynote speakers will be live streamed here in the auditorium beginning at 6.30 Wednesday night. We'll have our normal service in here, but we, uh, the, the adult classes will remain in here this coming Wednesday night, and we will hear uh, Brother David Shannon uh, for uh, that uh, evening. And then Thursday evening, uh, T.J. Kirk, I believe, and Friday evening is um, Lonnie Jones. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so those will be uh, live-streamed here. If you want to come here, that would be a wonderful time. Uh, for fellowship. It's great that there's, it's just about 35, 40 miles away and uh, a lot of opportunities and uh, if you'd like to take part of that. Our theme for the year has been sharing our hope from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be always ready and willing to give a defense of anyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you and do so with meekness and in fear, reverence and godly Oh, we've been talking about this periodically. Last week, I talked about being an everyday witness for Christ, an everyday witness for Jesus. And this little handout, little card from uh, house to house, heart to heart, has 18 evangelism ideas for every church member. Those are available on the uh, exit tables or entrance tables and also by the communion tables and the round table. These are very practical, simple things that will be helpful, that will help you to be more soul conscious and thought and thinking about others. Uh, it's not something you have to, uh, you're probably doing some of this already, but it'll help you. To, I encourage you to get one of those, think about it, put it on your refrigerator, take a picture of it, keep it in your phone, and look at it periodically. So that's available for you. Today, talk about what can and what did and what will God do? What can God do? What did God do? What will God do? Ephesians 3 and verse 20 has been a long time favorite scripture of mine. It became very uh, close to me when I was living in Meridian, Mississippi. And after I'd been preaching about six years there, I was studying through Ephesians and doing some preaching, and this verse just came off the page to me. It came off the page to me because it reminds me. It reminds me that God is not limited. It reminds me that mere human accomplishments are limited. In fact, Jesus said in John 15 and verse 5 that I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. 
But Ephesians 3.20 reminds us or reminds me that faithfully acknowledge that God is not limited. And I have some blanks on your outline if that's helpful to you to fill out. God is not limited. Now unto him. I don't know if you can see this or not to read it aloud with me. Now to him. Okay, all right, it won't hurt you. You've been singing together. Let's read together. Here we go. Now to him. God is able. Let's talk about the text a little bit this morning. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, we'll look at several verses together and some others surrounding as we look through together. Well, I have on your outline, what can God do? And the first thing I have there, well, it's up to me and you. Now, when I ask what can God do, God's going to do what God does. He doesn't need you and me to act and behave and to do. What I'm trying to say when I ask what can God do, I'm asking what can God do through you and me? What can God do through us? And the answer to that, according to the text, if I understand it, is it's up to me and you what we let God do through us in all our different relationships, in all our different situations in life. What can God do? Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So what is that power that works in us? What is he talking about in Ephesians 3 and verse 20? Is that power some type of special, esoteric, better felt than told, a special spiritual uh, connection, or as we say in the South, a spiritual whammy? Uh, we don't want a big one, you know. Somebody just laid something on you. Something that we don't really can't control, we don't know anything about, it just happened to us? No, 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 it's not that. That's not my understanding. That's not my understanding of what the text is teaching. You might hear people talk about that in religious circles, but that's not my understanding of what the text teaches. It's not some special, better felt than told feeling that somehow you got and don't know how in the world you got it. It was just pressed upon you. According to the power that works in us, well, here's my understanding, and I have a, a, a blank there for you. The power that he's talking about in verse 20 is Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith and our surrender, our obedience unto God. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think if we will let him. If I will let him, if you will let him, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now, that power, as I understand it, in context is our faith, commitment, surrender unto Christ, especially verse 17, we'll get to it. So if you have your Bibles open, let's look a little closer at these verses in Ephesians chapter Three. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. Cody read part of it there a moment ago, and we'll get to that last uh, climactical part. But we've got to back up to see the context. This is a prayer that Paul extends, and as he's writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, and he is praying for them. He says, I am praying for you. Notice verses 14 and 15 is the prefix of the prayer. For this reason, Paul is writing, he says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He says, I bow my knees, and this is what I pray. Look at verse 16. 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Notice what else he prays, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and depth, and height, verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What a prayer. What a prayer. Let's look at it a little closer. Verse 16. I pray that you, God, would grant you, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. He talks about the riches of his grace in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Philippians 4, 19, he talks about the riches, God's riches in glory. What's he talking about? According to the, his, the riches, his riches in glory that you might be strengthened. We'll answer that in just a second. We're going to look at it all, trying to just weave it all together here. You might be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Strengthened. The word means to fortify, to brace, to be empowered. And He uses that word dynamis, didymus, dynamite. That's where we get that word from. That you, that God would grant you, that you would be filled by His Spirit with His dynamite, his power in the inner man. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 talks about the inner man and the outward man. The inner man is that soul, the inside, the spirit, the very core being of who we are, not the flesh and blood, not the outer man, but the inner. He says, I pray that God will fill you, that you will let God fill you with his power and strength. The storehouse of God's riches is unlimited. According to his riches, or, or the riches of his glory, that God would, from his storehouse of riches and power and might, that he would fill you. But he's saying, look, God can do it, but I'm really praying that you will let him do it. I'm praying that you will submit, that you will surrender, that you will say yes to God and let God rule, reign in your life. He prays for them to have God's power, God's strength, and in abundance according to the riches of his glory. Verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, verses 16 and 17 is not really, as I understand it in context, it's not really two different things. It's all intertwined, interconnected. He's saying, look, what I'm praying for is that you will have the faith that you need to have that God's power and His might and His strength may reign in your heart and life. And he goes on. Shall dwell in your, Christ may dwell in your hearts. This word dwell is an interesting word. It means literally to dwell or to, to live in, to settle in. He's saying, look, I don't want you to try to have faith just on Sunday. I don't want you to just have faith just one or two days a week. I don't want you to just have faith and have the, the, uh, uh, the, the strength and might and power of God. I don't want you to just have that like a weekend visitor. No, I want you to let that come in and dwell, live every day, every day. What can God do? What are we letting him do? It's up to me and you. Am I letting him dwell every day or just when I put on my Sunday suit? 
dwell in your hearts through faith. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We learn from the Word of God what is faith and how to have faith, how to live faithfully. We learn. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ dwell in your heart and strengthened by spirit and inner man are not really two different things. Paul sometimes blends things. In Romans chapter 8, he talks about the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, and he talks about them almost interchangeably. They are part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the God the Father, God the Son. And so the, the uh, uh, dwelling in your heart by faith and the strengthened by spirit, uh, uh, by his spirit, by uh, his might. They're not two different things. It's all intertwined, all intertwined. That you may, verse 17, the latter part of verse 17, that you, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Firmly rooted, firm foundation. You be established with strength. Both verbs are in the perfect tense. In the original language. And what that means is that, that you may be rooted and grounded. You may become rooted. You may become established in love and faith. And that rootedness and that establishedness of love remain that way. That it starts and you don't ever quit. You let it move and you let it live and you let it grow and you cultivate it so that it does grow. Rooted and grounded in love, above all things, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, put on love, which is the bond or the glue of perfection. The glue that holds everything else that's good together. Paul, as I understand it here, is praying for people to be real in their commitment to God. He is not praying that we be religious when it's time to go to church. He is praying that we be real in our faith walk day by day. Christ will dwell in our hearts. Becoming and continuing and being firmly rooted and grounded and established in love so that, verse 18 and 19, you may be able to comprehend, to grasp completely the length, the breadth, the height of Christ's love, which is so magnificently wonderful, it surpasses everything that can be known. What a prayer. Look at it again. Notice with me, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, spiritual family, Christ church, all of God's followers, verse 16, that he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that you may be strong like dynamite from the core of your being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be rooted, firmly rooted, and established, grounded in love. God is love, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, the width, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What can God do? It's up to me and you. God's going to be God if we do nothing. But what can God do through you, in your home, in the workplace, in, among your family and friends, the circles of influence that you live and walk in? What can God do through you and me, me and you? according to the power that works in us. And that power in context, particularly in verse 17, is our faith, surrender, commitment, obedience unto Christ. It all works together, as I said, whenever we allow ourselves to be strengthened mightily by God's Spirit 
and let Christ dwell in our hearts by faith, we can try and we try more and more to fully grasp the length and breadth and height of the wonderful, magnificent, and really incomprehensible love of Christ. Whenever we do that, then God is able to do and to function and to live abundantly in our lives. That's what I understand the text to say. So when I was studying through this several years ago, this just jumped off the page to me. And I tried to quote it and put it to memory and remember it because it convicts me now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. May the church, may Christians always forever and ever let this be who they are. Let her be. What can God do? It's really up to me and you. Well, God can do unlimitedly if we will let him. Now think about what he says. He can do unlimitedly. Do you like that word? Does that word scare you? It might. He is able to do unlimitedly if we will let him. If I will let him. If you We'll let him. What are we letting God do? Or are we letting him do and trying to let him do every day? Or are we putting him on on Sunday? Or when we're only in certain circles? Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. God is able. God is not feeble. God is able. God is not feeble. Listen to him now unto him. I want you to let God be in your heart and life every day and be filled with the power of God and live it. God is able. He is able to do he is a doer. He doesn't just talk about it. He doesn't just say, well, it'd be nice if we talk to somebody about the Lord. No, he does it. It would be nice if he would save the world. No, he does it. He does it. He is able to do. And he's able to do through me and you if we'll let him. He is able to do. He is not weak. He is not limited. Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. That's true. He spoke the world into existence. Jesus to his disciples, he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. God is not weak, not limited. In Genesis 18 and verse 14, the messenger said to Sarah when uh, he came and told Abraham and Sarah that she's going to have a child. She's 90 years old. And she laughed. She said, yeah, right. And he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? When the angel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, in Luke chapter 1, when the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have a son, and that son is going to be the Savior of the world, and Mary said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I, I'm, I'm a virgin. I hadn't been with any man. How am I going to have a son? For with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing. I forget that, do you? Isaiah 43 and 13, I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am, and there is no one can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who can reverse it? Nobody. Whatever God does, he does, and it's done. 
We certainly understand that God is sovereign. Romans 11 verse 13, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. He's sovereign. He's ruler. God is able. He is not feeble. God is not weak. God is not limited. But look at what Paul said. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, super abundantly, above all, way beyond anyone's ability to measure the highest form of comparison imaginable, according to Art and Gingrich's lexicon of this word. Super abundantly, beyond measurability, immeasurably more, some translations say. God is able to do beyond measure. You can't comprehend what God can do if you'll let Him. You can't comprehend what kind of husband you will be if you will let Him. You can't comprehend what kind of wife you will be if you will let God be in your heart and life. You can't imagine what kind of son or daughter, what kind of Christian, what kind of co-worker, what kind of business owner. You can't imagine what God can do. You can't measure it if you will let him. If you will let him. Steve, he is able to do above all that we ask or think, all that we request, all that we're able to reason and understand or imagine. Maybe we don't imagine enough. Maybe we don't think enough. What can God do? It's up to me and you. He's able to do unlimitedly above all that we request or reason or understand or imagine. King, New King James, him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. NIV says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. English Standard, him who is able to do far more abundantly than we all ask or uh, think. New American Standard, he's able to exceedingly abundantly do above all of what we ask or think. New Living Translation, God, glory be to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Easy to read translation for the deaf. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or think of. Do we believe that? I want to believe that better, don't you? I want to believe that better according to the power that's in us, if we will let him. And we've already talked about what that power is, our faith, commitment, surrender unto God. Our saying yes to God. God can do unlimitedly if we will let him according to the power that works in us. Well, lastly, what can God do? What will God do? What did God do? What will we let him do according to the power that works in us? Do we limit God because of our lack of faith? According to the power, the faith, surrender, commitment that is in you, do we limit God because of our lack of faith? I've been guilty. I'm trying to be less guilty. I suspect you are too. You wouldn't come to an assembly like this unless you were somehow made to come today, unless you cared about those things. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, uh, above all that we ask or think, according to the faith of power that works in us, but do we lack faith? Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the tiniest, tiniest little bit of the real thing, if you have faith as a size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. 
We read this. You've heard me preach this. We read this, and you know what we do so often? We say, hyperbole. It's just exaggeration. It's just exaggeration for, inst for, for uh, emphasis. Hyperbole. Shame on us. James says, Elijah, James chapter 5, verse 16, or 14 and following, was a man like passions as we, yet he prayed that it might not rain, and it didn't rain upon the earth for the space of three years and six months. Three and a half years. It didn't rain. Did I get that right? Three and a half years? That's a long time, isn't it? Even as I tried to rehearse it and th go back through it, I thought, wait, it does say three and a half years. That's a long time. Then he prayed again that it would rain, and it did rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit in its season. What's the difference? If it be God's will, that it not rain in three and a half years, and a mountain be moved, if it be God's will. Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you say to this mountain, move. It will move. Problem is, is Steve says, I don't have that much faith. Do we limit God because of our lack of faith? Do we fail God because we're afraid? In Matthew chapter 14, a man, a man was out in a boat in a storm. And Jesus came walking on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus, or the disciples, they said, well, we think it's the Lord. We think it's Jesus. And, Je and Peter said, Lord, if it be you, command me or bid me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on. And that man got out of the boat in a storm. He got out of the boat and started walking on water. Do you believe that? Or is that just one of them preacher stories? Do you believe that? Oh, he, he walked. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, you know the text, he started noticing the wind and, and, the, and, the, and the waves, and he thought, what am I doing? Now, the text doesn't say that, but that's my idea of what he probably did. I don't know. That's probably what I'd have done. What am I doing? Boy, I made a big mistake here. He walked on water. And he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And look what Jesus said. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I feel like that more than once in my life, Jesus could have said to me, Steve, you have such little faith. Why did you doubt? Do we fail God because of social consequences? Peter warned himself by the fire, and they asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples? He said, Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest said, didn't I see you with him in the garden when we arrested him? And Peter denied it again. Oh, in certain circles. Oh, man, I, I, I just got to watch. Do we fail God because of lack of dedication? The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Do we fail him because we have limited vision? They were offended at him. Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Is he not doing mighty works in your life and my life because we don't have the faith to let him do it? This verse convicts me, y'all. Are we limited in God's works because of unbelief? belief. Well, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. What are we letting him do? Well, it's up to us according to the power that works in us. He can do unlimited if we will let him. 
and what are we letting him do? This morning, will you let him have his way with you? Would you let him uh, cleanse your life from sin as you surrender obedience to the gospel, to be baptized for the remission of sins, to be added to the family of God by the Lord himself? If you do that today, surrender obedience to the gospel. If you've done that previously and you would desire as a Christian to walk more closely, to let God do more faithfully in your heart and life, and you seek the prayers of this gathered body on your behalf, when we confess our sins and pray for forgiveness, he keeps on cleansing us of all unrighteousness. He's calling. Do you need to come? It's together with Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Thank you for joining us today for a lesson that was presented to the congregation at Hilldale Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. Anytime you are in the Clarksville area, we invite you to worship with us. A schedule of our services and directions to the building can be found on our website, www.hilldalecc.org Here's my life, Lord Speak what is true Speak what is true